a really heavy history here, huh? So there's Big Ben. <laughs> this is the treasury. There's 10 Downing Street. It's just that alley right there. Buckingham Palace is just inside the St. James Park. And then this is 10 Downing Street. So right down there, you can just go part way down. If you just go right around the corner here is the bomb shelter that Churchill used during World War II. These are the underground secret rooms where Churchill and his war cabinet conducted the war. So people at the time didn't know about them. So you can see this is the ground level and we're just going to walk down. And it's really, it's about three metres. It's not that far. It's just a basement. So people at the time, they'd be walking up on the street above and they had no idea that the most important people in the country were down here. This corridor here would have been um, Mr Bracken was, um, you know, um, Brendan Bracken, Churchill's private secretary. Um, so that would have been his room. Um, so he would have been on site if he needed to be. And then the dining room, it's just through here. So that's the dining room. So you can see all laid out. I mean, not super luxurious, but the best they could do in these sort of basement environment. Commander Thompson would have been over here. That was Churchill's um, bodyguard. Typist Paul down there, his detectives down there. So this is kind of a, a little area of the site which would have been for Churchill's sort of immediate staff and family. There's Mrs Churchill's room there. They didn't actually start coming down here until the Blitz. Churchill wasn't too worried about the risk of bombing, to be perfectly honest. It got to a bad point on the 14th of October 1940 when Downing Street itself was hit by a bomb. The kitchen of Downing Street where his cook was preparing a very delicate sauce for his dinner. She didn't want to leave it but he persuaded her to leave it because the bombing was getting closer and actually it pretty much destroyed the kitchen so he saved her. So yeah, this is the, the small kitchen area where um, Churchill's cook Mrs Landermere could prepare meals for the Churchills. I mean, it's just a small area, but you can see there would have been an, enough to be able to make meals for Churchill's exacting standards. <laughs> so, here we are in Churchill's bedroom and office combined. Um, he did work from here sometimes, and we know that he made four radio addresses. So you'll see the microphone there on the, the table. And I mean, people tuned into these. These were an event. So during the height of the Blitz, he was speaking to the nation about this threat that Britain was facing, and he was trying to sort of rally people's morale. Now, Churchill wasn't a huge fan of sleeping down here. Churchill was known for um, his love of luxury. This wasn't really quite up to his standards, but it was still the most luxurious room on site. You'll notice it actually has carpet, but you'll notice it's quite a narrow sort of small bed. I'm sure he would have preferred much, much larger, more comfy bed. So he used a chamber pot, which he called a gazunda because it goes under the bed. <laughs> Little wash basin. So also crucially, this site didn't have plumbing. So that was a real issue for Churchill because he liked to have two baths a day. But you'll notice too the big maps on the walls. He loved maps and these here are for the home defences. And you'll see the curtains. That meant that if anyone came in who wasn't supposed to see those maps, they'd be able to draw the curtains quickly. But shall we go into the wall cabinet room? So this is the wall cabinet room. This was really the main reason that this site is here. So this was going to be the safe place that the members of the War Cabinet could meet if there was bombing, if there was threats above ground. And the War Cabinet were the people who were really running the war for Britain. So when Churchill became Prime Minister in May 1940, he came down to this room and he said, this is the room from which I will direct the war. And he formed his wall cabinet and he made it quite a small cabinet. He thought that would make it more efficient. So they didn't actually start coming down here until the Blitz. And Ch Churchill wasn't too worried about the risk of bombing. But when Downing Street itself was hit, the next day, the 15th of October, they came down here and they had their wall cabinet meeting in here. And it was at 5 p.m., which is why we've set all our clocks to two minutes to five. So the meeting's about to commence. 
And what you'd find in this room was the atmosphere was tense. They'd have arguments, they'd have disagreements. You know, Churchill was a very strong-willed character. He sat here in this chair and you can see there are marks on the armrests of the chair. That one there is where he had his gold signet ring and he would rub that. He would get very agitated and worked up. You can see the three chairs there, which are sort of immediately opposite Churchill. These were for the chiefs of staff. Now these were the heads of the army, the navy and the Royal Air Force. And they would be right across from him and he would be able to get in their face and really kind of hold them to account. It would have been a smoky atmosphere as well. Everyone smoked during those years. And that right there, Churchill's cigar. So actually, it, it wasn't going to be that pleasant of an environment to be in because we're down here. Mm. It's a really stuffy environment. But what they did have was an air filtration system. But that air was pumped in from Horse Ferry Road, which is just nearby in Westminster. So you're really just getting the traffic fumes coming down. It wasn't very healthy. <laughs> and also people down here working for hours on end, you'd get quite disoriented as to what was going on up, up above. You're kind of down in the darkness all the time. You don't know what time of day it is. There's also a red and green lights over the door. Green if it's okay, red means there's an air raid happening. So it's just to keep them updated as to what's going on above ground. And actually this room was one of the most secret rooms so many people who worked on site never actually saw this um, no women were allowed in here so women who worked here in the war came back many years later to look around and they actually came in here it was the first time they saw it because they'd never been allowed in so it was that secretive we've got the maps on the wall of course and I particularly love how large Britain is in this map compared to the rest of the world so I think you get a sense of the sort of thinking going on in this room Churchill loved maps. He actually had his own mobile map room. So yeah, this is the main corridor of the site. Um, and you'll see this board here where the weather forecast was put. So because obviously you're down here for hours on end, you don't know what it's going to be like up above ground. And you'll see these kind of alcoves and sort of things sticking out the wall. If there was a bomb blast, you know, these would sort of um, lessen the shock waves and lessen the effect of it. So that's why these were kind of built in like this. And this was the basement of what is above us. It was a steel framed building. Yeah, no, we're still right next door to the treasury. Well, exactly. But beneath what it's now the treasury building. Another reason they chose the site was the location was just ideal. It's near the House of the Parliament, it's near Number 10 Downing Street, Buckingham Palace, and it's near a lot of the ministries that were involved in the war. So yeah, the, the site expanded over time, so it, it started out with a smaller number of rooms, and then as more and more people wanted to work down here because it was such a useful site to work from, they added in new offices and, and places which they could work in. So you get people here like people working in strategic planning, people from the secret intelligence. Because it was such a secure site to work in, it was guarded by Royal Marines, it wasn't known about, and you also had up-to-date information about what was happening in the war, which we're going to go through and see in the map room. Oh, I did it. <laughs> it's always a tricky door, that it feels one. secure. They are, yeah, this is all original. This operated 24-7 throughout the war. There would have been four duty officers working in here at any one time. Um, they'd be from each of the services, the Army, Navy, Royal Air Force, and then someone from the war office as well. And they would be basically receiving information, up-to-date information, as to what was happening in the war. And they would get it via phone. So these phones would actually light up, they wouldn't ring, and that's how they get information through, also through telegram and letter, and that would come down through those tubes there, the air compression tubes. So that would spill in information, and they would give the information to the plotters, who then added that information to the maps on the wall. This is one of the most incredible items that we have here, and this is a sort of convoy map, we called it, because it maps all of the different shipping that was happening across the world. And you can see all the pinpricks in that just tells you how much movement there was during the war. So there's actually this section here where they've had to cover up part of the map um, because it had so many pinholes in it that they had to add in some more paper just to cover that up. Just near Gibraltar there. Oh. You can see this whole wealth of pinpricks and you can just get a sense of this just how global the war was, and also for Britain, how much it relied on these supply routes 
it's an island, you know, a seagoing nation. So of course, when the Germans were threatening that during the Battle of the Atlantic, their U-boats were sinking the ships and that lifeline was really threatened. So the fact that Britain was eventually able to win that battle was really crucial for it during the war. And a large part of how it was able to do that was reading the Enigma traffic. So the Enigma code was broken at Bletchley Park uh, and that gave Britain the edge in this war. And although it seems sort of quite low tech now, at the time this was the height of technology. You know, the, the phones, and many of the phones were scramble phones. That meant that anyone trying to listen in wouldn't have been able to understand what they were saying. So this was really high tech. And was there a reason why the phones were all different colors? Yeah, I think they, they denoted different places that they were getting the calls from or could be called to. You also notice they don't have dials in them because they just go direct to one number. So it would be in the, the Army HQ or the RAF HQ and there's one, one phone which goes to the Prime Minister's office, for example. So they'd have these immediate lines um, that they'd be able to, to go to. So this is the book that the maps would be signed out in. I mean, this is the original pencil. It's worn away to a nub. In wartime, you used up everything as much as you could. And you can see that it's been signed out by the PM, by Churchill himself. As I say, he loves his maps. <laughs> And this was another place on the site that was really restricted. So only around 40 people had clearance to come in here. And even the king, when he came to visit, he had to sign in. Um, you know, it, it was really top secret. Churchill loved coming in here because he loved maps and he, he loved um, knowing what was going on in the war. And you'll see on that board there from the Battle of Britain. These were times that were not easy for anybody, no. but the sense of responsibility people working here would have. Was... Mm. That's very true. And in terms of, say, um, when they were plotting the convoys, they'd be plotting when they were sinking as well. So the men in here, and it was only men working in here, they would ha have this quite heavy duty, actually. They would know how many lives were being lost. It would be a constant up-to-date picture of what was happening. At, at points, it was a very dark picture. They wouldn't really be able to share that with their friends, family outside, because it was all top secret. Let me just check again, yes. <laughs> oh, so this is quite a fun thing here. So you'll see here it says engaged. You might think toilet, right? You know, it's engaged, it's busy. So that's what they wanted people to think who worked here at the time that this was Churchill's private toilet. So he was the only person on site who had their own toilet. I mean, that would make sense. But in actual fact, it was a little cupboard that was transformed into a way that he, Churchill, could have a secret hotline to the President of the United States. This was top secret at the time and it was high tech, this was cutting edge technology. The handset there was how Churchill could pick up and speak securely to Roosevelt and then later Truman. And it was really the latest technology. So there were things like the, the scramble of telephones that we saw, but they actually could be hacked into. They knew that was an issue and they wanted to be able to speak securely because of that, that relationship was very important. So Bell Telephone Company in the US developed this new technology called Sig Sally. They wrapped the conversation in sound which masked what was actually being said. And, and what the end result was, was that the, the voice of Roosevelt and Churchill sounded different to how it actually was in person. And Churchill found it a bit strange. He sort of said Roosevelt sounded like Donald Duck. But it was this amazing thing. And, and actually, it was housed in Selfridge's basement. So the, the technology, it was so large that they couldn't house it here. So it was in the basement of Selfridge's department store on Oxford Street, which was um, even further below ground than here. And so the, the line was put out here to the cabinet war rooms. There was also a, an extension to number 10 Downing Street and also an extension to the US Embassy building. And then over in the States, it was housed at the Pentagon. And then there was an extension out to the White House. It was quite an incredible piece of technology and it wasn't known about here at the site. People thought it was Churchill's private toilet and in actual fact it was a little cupboard where he would be able to speak to the president. So even here in a secret site you get places which are secret from the people that are here. <laughs> so below this site there was something called the dock but it wasn't very pleasant. You wouldn't really want to go down there. But what it was, was emergency accommodation for the people who worked here. So say you'd had a really long shift, you could go and crash down there basically and get some sleep. But it wasn't very pleasant and many people actually preferred to take the risk of going home even during the bombing.
And then down at the end there, where you can hear the noise coming from. That was the meeting room used by the Chiefs of Staff. We created a meeting that we know took place here. Your chance might divert us into an escalating campaign of revival. And there was a great risk. So this is later on in the war. Obviously during the Blitz, the site is used a lot, but then that danger sort of passes mid-1941. We should just continue our attacks on German industrial targets. But then in June 1944, the V-weapon attacks start. When they start coming over the V-1, flying bombs and causing a lot of destruction, it forces the meetings back below ground. So they're debating what they're going to do about these V-weapon attacks. We've got a map of the area and we are here with the Churchill War Rooms and we've put on here where the different bomb locations were that fell near this site. So you can just get a sense of how close the bombing came to the Churchill War Rooms. And of course there was that one that hit number 10, Downing Street, and, and forced the War Cabinet to come down here to meet on the 15th of October 1940. Um, so this cluster of bombing, it does show that they did need a safe place because the bombs were falling very nearby. Um, there's also there, if you can see that building, the Guards Chapel. So that red bomb that fell on that is actually a V-1. So that's a really destructive flying bomb. V-1s were the secret rockets. Exactly. The Nazi army. Yeah, the pilotless flying bombs. So they were the first ones and then the V-2 were the rockets. They were random, they were terror weapons because you couldn't really do anything against them. So you can see a slab here, you can see how thick that was. And that's what Churchill himself ordered to be added to the site, to add that extra layer of protection. The concrete itself is up there, and then beneath it is the metal corrugated sort of trough which held it. And then beneath that you've got the steel girders and the wooden props. So this is the building, and then this is where the war rooms are. But you can see the wooden props that were added in, and that trough, and then the slab itself that have been put in to fill in that space. So that's what is now the Treasury Building. At the time, it was a government building. So you can just see we're not that far below ground. It started out as being a few, a few of the rooms, but then it expanded. Throughout the war, this was a, a hub, a hive of activity. And then on the 16th of August, 1945, it just stopped. It would have been silence. Everyone left, they packed up and they left. And that was it, because it was the end of the war. It was no longer needed. You also see at the end there, the mannequin there is meant to be John Hegarty. There's a quite special thing that he left behind, which the museum only noticed when we came to, in the 1980s. Someone opened the door. What they found in one of the drawers was sugar cubes. <laughs> obviously, sugar was rationed. He obviously wrapped it up um, on his last shift, put it in there and left. And it was then found by museum staff many, many years later. So people just left everything? Well, this room was preserved along with the war cabinet room and Churchill's bedroom. These were really just sealed up and left. It's how it was left. It was really frozen in time. 